Hey, hi everyone. Uh, really glad to have some two great guys with me today. This is Kimonya from Lead by Choice. We are hanging out and having a really interesting discussion with uh, two great guys. Ted Coiner. Ted is uh, a Forbes top 10 social media power influencer. Really, really cool. And an Inc. Uh, top 100 leadership expert. He's also the co-founder of Switch and Shift, a leadership, culture, and change blog. And uh, that, that's a really interesting blog for you to visit. Uh, Mark Babbitt, I hope I got your name right, Mark. Uh, he's the CEO and founder of UTAN, and uh, UTAN is a social community for young careerists, uh, and uh, Mashable calls it the top five online communities for starting your career. Uh, but today we are not talking about any of that. We are talking about some really cool book that um, uh, Mark and uh, Ted have just written, A Wild Gone Social, and we're just going to have a discussion around that. Welcome, Mark and uh, Ted, and uh, thank you for giving uh, uh, your time to be here with us. Kimunya, thank you so much for having us. I feel like we're old friends because we've been engaging so much on email and Twitter that this is a very natural transition to, to speak with you face to face. Awesome. Yes, thank you, thank you, Kimunya, and and I'll, uh, just for me personally, uh, this is my first call ever to Kenya, so I'm I am thrilled to be here today. Yeah. Mm, there's uh, something I really, that really got me thinking about uh, social media, and I, I'd actually call it the theme of the book, More Social, Less Media. Um, how, how did you come up with uh, that coinage? Mark uh, invented that one. He, he took something I had been sharing with audiences for a while and really improved it so much. It's, it's his idea. Mark, go ahead. Well, it's uh, it, it, as as we were doing the work to put the, the book together, Kamunya. One of the things that we found was that people, companies specifically, but but also individuals, had decided that social media and especially Twitter, perhaps, but also Facebook and to a certain extent LinkedIn, had become a, a branding channel, a, a, a marketing ploy. And, and it occurred to us that they kind of missed the boat, that the operative word in the phrase social media was social. And, and to, go, to take that and make it media without being social, it just seemed so counterintuitive to Ted and I. And, and so, so we did coin that phrase, and it's, and, it's, and it's catching on. It's kind of fun when you see it showing up uh, you know, uh, in the Twitter stream and in blog posts and stuff. Uh, because I think it hit home for people that, yeah, that you know what we, this allows us humans, no matter where we are in the world, and this and this call today is a great example of this, to to socially engage with others, and it doesn't it doesn't have to be a social, uh, uh, it doesn't have to be a broadcast tool, it doesn't have to be a, a media channel, it allows us to connect human to human, and so that's where the phrase comes from. And I, I think what you mentioned there is really important uh, because I find more and more that especially organizations will use social media as a megaphone, you know, trying to push uh, stuff out and forgetting that it's actually supposed to be an interaction. And that naturally leads me to the second um, observation from, from the book. And this is all around the death by a thousand cuts, you know, uh, how social can actually weaken your brand if you don't take care of it. Um, Ted, would you like to engage with this? Death by a Thousand Cuts is absolutely true. And here's the thing. We're, what we wrote about was leadership of your business in the social age. And, of course, leadership of your personal brand. It's just kind of a natural follow-up. What we weren't writing about was here's how to have a great Facebook campaign. You know, there are people who really are great at doing that. That's not us. The, the thing that many companies are still doing – by far most, is they are broadcasting at us. And it's so easy to ignore that. Instead, what people want is what people have always wanted, which was what we are doing right now, a two-way conversation. The brands that get that are you know, thriving, and the brands that don't are not. And here's where that comes into play with the death by a thousand cuts. So you have a brand that is clearly just not listening on social. It's just broadcasting its message, you know, here's a discount if you click this link, here's what are, uh, you know, some good press, that type of thing. 
who cares about that? And when there is a problem and people go to the social web, which we are all doing now, to, you know, complain to the company or to bring it up with their friends and the company isn't listening, ouch. Now, the bigger problem, so we, we have a great example in there. We have several great examples of this, but one of them is, for instance, um, United Airlines versus Southwest Airlines. The same basic idea of disgruntled customers. One handled it horribly, that's United, and one handled it really, really well, that's Southwest. Now, this is not a social media listening issue, really. Deeper, it's a company culture issue. Since 1972, Southwest Airlines has been building this fan of this fan base of goodwill among its flyers because they have been doing things right. They treat their employees right. They treat their customers right. And everyone loves Southwest Airlines. Occasionally, they screw up. United, on the other hand, has not been acting that way since long before 1972. So what happened when there was bad will on social media because of you know some, some people getting disgruntled and, and sharing it with the web, the, the people flying United and familiar with United said, you know, okay, me too. I, I completely believe that this happened and I, I'm just ready for it to happen to me next. The people on Southwest, Southwest handled it well and the problem went away very quickly. Now, what's the difference? Is that a social media handling issue? No, it's a company culture issue. It's a company healthy leadership that cares about people issue. The thousand cuts really go much deeper than just, you know, oh boy, there was a problem. We didn't handle it well. We didn't put out a fire. It's when there's a fire, is that unusual? And do people give you some slack? Or is that just another day at the office? We think we are separated and because we cannot see each other physically, that we are safe. And uh, something that you mentioned, uh, the two of you mentioned in the book, is the whole issue about the six degrees of separation. And that th those have been shrunk down to just uh, uh, two degrees. And it just reminds us that social, as you mentioned, is not a campaign. Social is a commitment. The moment you go in there, you're committing yourself to engage with your, with your clients. How does social media affect leadership? You know, and uh, I think I want to throw this to Mark. How does it, do you, do you see a correlation between social media and leadership? And I'm talking about both uh, leadership as an individual, but also leadership as an organization. There is a direct connection between social and leadership, Cunha, but it, it may not be what some people think. Here's what we found out. Uh, the social leaders, which we in the book call the blue unicorn because it's so rare. It's so rare that we aren't just looking for unicorns. We're looking for a very specific color of unicorn. Uh, it's, it's, it's not necessarily in the C-suite. It's not a top-down leadership issue. You know, many of the, of, the, of the big changes or the trends or even the fads that have hit the leadership community have been, a, have been a, almost exclusively a top-down issue. You know, think of total quality management from the 80s and 90s and, and many other, um, you know, aspects of this. Social leadership is happening everywhere. It's happening from the newest college graduate that walks in with a new way of handling a customer service issue, a new way of listening, a new way of communicating, and now they're leading very informally. They don't have the title on the business card. They don't have the little plaque on the desk, but they know how to do this better. And and the, the results are significant and they're immediate and, and they're leading teams informally. So, and in the meantime, sometimes in those very companies, the CEO is up on the 62nd floor saying, ah, social media is just a fad. It's never going to catch on. I don't have time for this. You know, I hate Facebook, blah, 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 right? So, so it is, there is a direct connection between social and leadership, but, but it's definitely not always the top down. Matter of fact, top down is probably far less frequent from what Ted and I found out than bottom up. Exactly. And I think top down actually ends up being very dangerous because then uh, you end up with uh, too many gaffes um, on, on, on your Twitter stream or, uh, you know, Facebook uh, news feed. Actually, there are some leaders who are doing real well with, um, with social media and engaging oh, there, uh, their clients. There are. are. And, and, yeah. And we should definitely, I mean, you think of what Richard Branson has done, Ariana Huffington, Jenny now at, at IBM and the amazing work she's doing at IBM with their 440,000 employees in a, in a company that's, 
that's long been considered, you know, the, the, the typical bureaucratic old school legacy corporation, she's completely mixing things up there. So top downs, it isn't as rare as maybe we're making it sound. And when it works, come on, it works amazingly well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, um, you know, there are some organizations or even the individuals who will say, you know, if I'm not on social media, you know, I'm fine. Uh, what, what's your take on that, Ted? Number one rule of doing business in 2014 plus, go where your customers are. That just happened to be the number one dual rule of doing business in uh, 1214 in the Middle Ages. You go where your customers are. Now, <laughs> back then they were in the village square. Today, your customers are on social. If you're not on social with them, you know, they're not reading newspapers anymore. That was a headline about 15 years ago that newspapers are going away. <laughs> they're... There, uh, in, in fact, I searched something and I got really old search results for some reason, and it, and it was stories from you know 2008, 2006 about how newspapers <laughs> are folding, right? So, but today people aren't reading static newspapers; they're going to Facebook and they're sharing with their friends. You know, I had this amazing experience at Panera Bread. They gave me this is an example from our book. They, they gave me some uh, soup for my grandma. They went out of their way to make this, right? Mm -hmm. And if Panera Bread isn't listening, oops, you know? But the good thing is 800,000 other people were listening, sharing this cool story. You don't want to miss that. And you just like you don't want to miss when something bad happens, you also don't want to miss when something good happens. So, so the guys say, oh, we're fine. We're not on social or we're B2B. We don't need it. If you're B2B, maybe stay away from Facebook. Spend more time on LinkedIn. LinkedIn groups are a great way to connect with people who need what you are selling. <laughs> so, so go ahead. Don't. It's a fad. It's going away. You have to be there. You have to be on social media. Whether to, And basically, it, it comes down to also managing your reputation. And also, um, I think uh, something that maybe I want Mark to just have a, a go at, the whole issue about authenticity. And authenticity, I think many people um, misrepresent what it actually is. So, Mark, in, in terms of um, remaining authentic, how much does social media play into um, amplifying your authenticity? Well, come on, yeah, I think uh, one of the first rules of social media that Ted and I discovered, and, and lots of other people are now too, is, is in order to be successful on social media, you you have to be human. You have to show the positive sides. You have to show maybe once in a while. You have to at least acknowledge the negative side. You have to be silly once in a while. You have to be a goofball once in a while. You you have to be you know you have to be um, forceful once in a while. Everything that we do in our normal lives, right? Especially as leaders, we need to be that on social media. When especially a high profile leader gets on social media or in some cases has their community manager pretend to be them or an intern pretend to be them on social media that you can't possibly be authentic in that way and and we mentioned some some leaders that have done amazingly well right of the Ariana Huffington's the Richard Branson's you know add Michael Dell to that list and a whole bunch of others now and and it's them and it's real and and their flaws are there, and the apologies when necessary are there, and the humor is there. And it's clear to everybody that they get it, that they're being their buzzword alert, authentic selves, right? And and then you, you, you compare that to somebody, you know, as great of a man as he probably is, uh, you compare that to Warren Buffett, right, who opened the Twitter account. 48 hours later had 1.3 million followers because he's Warren friggin Buffett. Right, and right. then I was one of them. And then, <laughs> yeah. And then, and then he never talks on Twitter, right? He's, he's, he's had his account for three years. He sent five tweets, right? So somebody in his crew, probably his community manager said, Hey, Warren, you need a Twitter account. And Warren went, yeah, whatever. Give me a Twitter account. Fine. Right. But he has, Clearly, no intention of supporting the Twitter account, no intention of communicating, no intention of being a role model, certainly no intention of being authentic. But when the when his board of directors and the media says, so what do you think about social media? He says, well, I have a Twitter account. Well, yeah, you have one, 
right? My six-year-old has one. It doesn't mean he spends much time on it or he's not very, not very influential, right? So, so it really is, you can't just, especially a high-profile leader, we can't just jump on Twitter just to say we did. You're, you're either all in or you're not. And, and the, the companies that are doing really, really well on social media, take, take Tangerine Direct up, uh, or Tangerine Bank up in Canada with Peter Aceto as their CEO. He was an early adopter of social, and, and he, he loves being there. He loves communicating. He loves engaging, not just with his customers, but with his employees too. And it's made their little bank really, really big, not just in the social space, but in the banking industry. They're, they're, when people you know, in all these old school banks look at the company that's doing social right within their industry, they go up to Peter Aceto and say, wow, amazing, amazing work you've done here. This is our emulation point. And, and I think that the problem that we have, um, or the fear that many executives could have, is that I just don't have time for social media. And uh, maybe it's just the misconception of uh, digital versus analog, because some of the, many of them are coming from an analog um, environment into a digital environment. And the, just the fear of having no time and forgetting that you can actually engage with social media from your notepad, you know, with pen and paper, and... You know, just basically the way you write your journal in the morning, you know, just write down a, a few points and then just type them out. And could this be an, a fear that social media is just going to overtake them and, you know, just envelop their whole lives? So, so here's the thing. So I, I have a bunch of local friends here in the Naples area, um, Naples, Florida, a lot of retirees and, and people don't, you know, they're not very active on social media, mm -hmm. some of my friends. So... Some of them were surprised the first time after learning that I was very active on social. They, they called me Twitter man and they were surprised that I would have lunch with them <laughs> and I wouldn't touch my phone. Wouldn't touch it. Nobody would hear it because I'm having lunch with them. Now, if you're a business leader and you're running a company, uh, please don't spend all your time on social. <laughs> but as you said... All you have to do is have an app on your smartphone and boom, read two tweets, reply to one of them. As you're walking from your desk to the door of your office, if it's a big, big corner office or if you're a more modern leader and you work with everybody, as you're, as you're going to get yourself a cup of coffee, right? You've got to take two minutes to leave your work for a second and do something. So check out... Check out what's going on in social. Check out what people are talking about, about your brand. And that way, you can have an informed decision about do we need to be social? Where should we invest our time? And here's one that I love, Kimonia, is what are people really saying about us? You know, for time and memorial, you have leaders who are out of touch with their customers and their when their organization gets to be a certain size and then they complain, boy, I, I wish I knew more. The intelligence that I'm getting from my staff is I I feel that it's maybe off. Okay, it's incomplete. Well, guess what? This is unfiltered intelligence. It's priceless. So so who wouldn't want that? And it's just like uh, going for your normal annual health check, you know, to make sure that your blood pressure is fine, your sugar, is, your sugar levels are fine. You're, you're, you're basically healthy. It gives you the pulse of exactly what is going on around you. And it's, it's for free. Uh, I, I, th I think that's what we need to remind ourselves, our, our, our colleagues, our business associates, that it's a reality and we need to be there. The issue is for us to embrace it and use it effectively. Um, not only to our advantage, but also to those we are engaging with. So it becomes a communication. Well, can you, I'll, let, me just, let me just add to the topic we just finished. I, at least here in the States, I'll share with you that, that one of the things Ted and I see when we work with and consult with leaders, industry leaders, to become social, one of the biggest challenges we have is, is not just taking them from their industrial age leadership style to social age, which is a big enough challenge as it is, but it's also a very personal challenge, uh, especially the bigger CEOs. They get they leave their townhome, they get in a company car, they drive the the driver drives the company car to their office. 
They take sometimes a private elevator to get up to their 62nd floor, beautiful office that stares out over the, over the, the cityscape. And they don't communicate with anybody along the way. And, and when, they, when they start their day, they have gatekeepers and they have filters and, and they don't communicate with anybody along the way. But one of the fundamental changes of, of a social leader is, is, is not just organizational, it's personal. It's, it's asking somebody who doesn't communicate on a regular basis to be a master communicator. And, and we shelter, at least in the, here in the U.S., we shelter our CEOs, as I started to say earlier. Nobody ever just talks to them. And... For the most part, that's how they prefer it. That's how they grew up. That's how they learned in business school to run a company and to lead. And now we're asking those leaders to step completely outside their comfort zones. And Ted and I see this all the time. We, leaders, well, it's not a time issue. It's not, it's not even a I'm afraid of change issue for some of them. For some of them, it's a very personal issue. You're asking me to, to leave behind everything I know about leadership and actually talk to people. And that scares me. That, that puts me out on the edge. I, it's, it's well outside my comfort zone. And I, I don't know if I'm the right, that, the right kind of person to do that. And, and what Ted and I tell them is fine. If you're absolutely sure, right, don't be like Warren Buffett. Don't do that right? Maybe you're not the right person to be the social leader in your company. Fine, but delegate. Find somebody who already is. Find the digital native. Find an up-and-comer. Find a boomer that has embraced this technology and is already doing amazing things on social and have them be the face of your company on social media. And, and then tell them, what are you talking about? How can I help you communicate? What do you need to hear from me? Right? When do you need me? Do you need me for a Skype call, a Google Hangout, a Twitter chat? Tell me when you need me, but enable that social leader within your company so your brand is seen as a social company, even if you aren't as a social leader. Awesome. And I think that's where authenticity is. When you're not strong at something, accepting you're not, but not brushing away um, a major avenue for engagement just because you're, you're weak. And I think that what, that's what basically makes us a strong leader. We are not all strong in everything. Uh, some people are very good orators. Others are very good script writers. And it's just finding that niche that you're strong at and making sure that you're utilizing it and empowering others. And I think that's what social media does. It empowers the customer. It empowers your partners you know, to engage with you and to, and to lead you. Um, Ted, I, I think in, in, um, um, in closing, just looking at... One example that uh, you and Becky, Becky Robinson um, uh, engaged with, who came through for you. <laughs> yeah, and, and actually, that's a great question because there's a follow-up. My shoes are on the way from one of those companies. So let me tell you that story. It, it makes me happy when there's a, you know, a happy ending. So, so uh, I don't know, maybe a, a year ago, I forget, but... Um, a while back, I just, I realized, I looked down at my running shoes. I wake up early and I run. I live in Florida, it's hot. So I, I wake up at the crack of dawn. And I looked down at my running shoes and I said, there's almost holes in these things. I need some new shoes now. I can't wait. And that's pretty much how I live my life. So as Mark can tell you, I'm, I'm occasionally impulsive and uh, the other occasions I'm sleeping. So uh, what, I, <laughs> so anyway, so. I figured, you know, this is a fun time for, no, what, the first thing I did, I'm sorry, the first time I, thing I did was I, I went to uh, Zappos, which is one of my favorite, you know, uh, websites because of its customer service. And I reached out to them, I just called them, and I said, you know, whoever, you know, I talked to, I said, you know, I need some shoes, can you help me through it? It's been a while since I bought shoes, and what are the latest? Uh, this person was not informed, which, as we point out, is not typical at all of this company. It was, you know, leading up to the Christmas rush, and clearly she was a new hire, and okay, Zappos gives amazing customer service, especially on the telephone. They're famous for that, so that, which is why I called them in the first place. So I was a little disappointed. So I went to Twitter. I said, okay, Zappos is famous for, you know, tweeting, and they're very engaging on Twitter. I've engaged with them many times. So let me just go and, and ask them about that. And I didn't, I said, can you call me to, to the people that I met on, on um, Twitter? And they didn't call me. I even direct messaged them my, my phone number, and they didn't call me. And I was 
I said, well, this is kind of weird. Let's see who wants to sell me some shoes. So then we're out of the gate. This is where the story gets really fun. So disgruntled by one brand, I just said, who wants to sell me sh some shoes? And I heard crickets. So I reached out to Nike, nothing. I reached out to New Balance, one of my favorite brands, nothing. I was really, Reebok, nothing. I was really disappointed. So then I hear this, I, I get this tweet from this guy. He says, uh, hi, this is Alex at Topo's. I'd like to sell you some shoes. What's your phone number? I'll call you. Okay, this guy's listening, which, by the way, was really, really simple. You can do that through. He was using Sprout Social. There's so much technology that allows you to listen in on conversations that are pertinent to you. Okay, so, so we get on the phone, and he tells me about the shoes that his company, eight people in his company, brand new. And the shoes were a little different from what I'm used to. So I said, you know, I'm not sure. Can you walk me through? He gave me all the information he had. And then he put me on with somebody who, who designed the shoes to tell me more. Well, then I bought the shoes. They sent them to me. I wore them, loved them. And I'm on my second pair of these shoes. Well, then, uh, in you know, because of the book, uh, Zappos found out about this. So, so here I am, I'm a crazy customer of Topos. I love the shoes, they're, they're wonderful. Um, but I still like Zappos a lot. And uh, we, we shop with them frequently. So, um, <laughs> so they reached out to me, they said, I am so sorry this happened. It was you know completely not the way we do things. First they did that on Twitter. Then they reached out to me on email and said, you know, we're really sorry. What can we do? At least let us send you a free pair of shoes. So there you go. I went online and they don't sell Topos yet. So I um, ordered some, um, some other shoes, not running shoes, uh, which should be uh, arriving tomorrow or the next day. Wonderful, wonderful examples of companies that are paying attention and other companies that are missing opportunities. And, I love that story. And, and, and here's the thing. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. And basically, when you mess up, you fess up. You just go. Yes, when you mess up, you fess up. Well, and here's the other thing. Here's the thing that's so exciting is Topos got in with me only because they capitalized on an opportunity. That's what social does. It allows your company, big or small, to bring change to your industry, to change the distribution of market share. It's an opportunity that will be gone in a few years when everyone is socially fluent. Right now, you can fear change and hide from it, get defensive about it, or you can bring change. And that's what Topos did. Yep, Mark. Can you tell this excites me? <laughs> well, I, you know, I, the part about this story I like just happened in the last, in the last couple of days, although I didn't get a free pair of shoes out of this deal, so I'm kind of pissed about that. But... <laughs> <laughs> but but here but here's Zappos. We actually wrote a blog post um, to support the book um, for 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 a, a leadership community, and we used the Zappos story in our blog post as an example of how social media is the great equalizer. As Ted said, even the smallest companies now can win customers over. We don't have to have the biggest organization, the biggest budget, the biggest team. One tweet makes a difference, and and active listening even before that makes a big difference. And and still, even though Zappos was, you know, the the I don't know, the the, the villain in this in this story, which they're not in that position very often as Ted alluded to, mm -hmm. they still had the you know what's to reach out to Ted and to me yeah. and say, read your story. I really appreciate the feedback. So sorry this happened. So maybe they weren't listening that morning. Ted bought their shoes. But they sure were listening now, and and again they've solidified. You know they're one of the biggest. They're one of the best, like Southwest and Container Store and a whole bunch of other companies. They have even before social came along, they had this great reputation for customer service, and they proved it again just by listening. That's that's my favorite part of the story. So that's a wonderful way to just uh, close our discussion. Regardless of where you are, social media you cannot ignore it. When you mess up, fess up. And finally, engage with your community. It's a two-way street. Have fun enjoying and uh, engaging with them. And uh, when things go wrong, you know, just make up and then and, and move on. It's a relationship. It, we are not perfect. We are human. Uh, we make mistakes and get great, great stuff going. 
really awesome to hang out with you, uh, Mark and, uh, and, and Ted. And uh, signing off for Lead by Choice. Um, thank you so much. And